Good morning, everybody. Welcome again for this uh, new colloquium from the Instituto Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Elisa Delgado Mena from the Instituto Astrofisica y Ciencias do Espacio, Universidad de Porto in Portugal. And she will talk about the impact of stellar composition from galactic chemical evolution to planet formation. So, uh, Dr. Delgado Mena will be properly introduced by Isabel Marquez. Isabel. Hola, René. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Welcome again to another Severo web colloquium, in this case, an online colloquium. And first of all, thank you very much, Elisa Delgado Mena, for having accepted, uh, accepted our invitation to, to give this, this colloquium. Um, Elisa Delgado Mena obtained her PhD in, in 2011 in the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, the IAC in Tenerife in Spain, where she studied the chemical abundances of light elements like lithium, beryllium, carbon, and, and oxygen in the atmospheres of exoplanet whole stars, and also how the formation of planets can influence such elements. Uh, after that, uh, she carried out her research uh, with the FCT postdoc fellowship in the Center for uh, Astrophysics in the University of uh, Porto in, in Portugal, the CIUP, um, from 20, uh, 2012 to 2016. And then uh, she got an IFCT contract in, 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 the, in the same uh, at the same university. Um, and she's author of more than 100 papers in, in peer reviewed publications since then. Her main research uh, interests um, are the derivation of stellar chemical abundances of solar type uh, stars, planet host stars and M dwarfs, the search and characterization of exoplanets especially around evolved stars, stellar variability and atmospheres and the chemical evolution of the galaxy. And, and today, as you, you know, because of the title of the talk, she will be talking about the impact of stellar composition from galactic chemical evolution to planet formation. Um, I say it again, it's a pleasure for us to have you here, Elisa Delgado, we, with us uh, in, in virtual format. And thank you very much, the floor is yours. Okay, so let me also thank you for the invitation. It's very nice. And I'm sorry I'm not in person, uh, uh, but okay. Um, okay, I will start uh, uh, with seminar. I'm going to touch different themes, uh, 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 different points that I have been uh, following during, during my career since uh, um, I have studied mostly the chemical abundances, but with different uh, aspects. And, and how they can help us uh, uh, to study different fields within astrophysics. So why these chemical abundances are important? Well, um, they are needed to understand how the galaxy was formed, the different component of the galaxies, and also to understand the nucleosynthesis processes that gave uh, uh, rise to, this, to these elements, which in turn uh, are needed to understand the galactic chemical evolution. Also, we need to know the chemical abundances from stars to, to do a proper uh, classification of stellar populations. Uh, and also, for example, with the techniques of chemical tagging. Uh, chemical abundances can also be complementary to the studies of uh, astroseismology and also to better understand stellar activity in stars. They can also be used to determine distances and ages. And last but not least, uh, they are very important uh, uh, to detect and characterize exoplanets. We need to know the stars that host exoplanets in order to, to correctly characterize such exoplanets. So in this talk, I'm going to focus in these two aspects of, uh, of how the chemical abundances can help us uh, to better understand uh, uh, these, uh, these two things that I'm uh, pinpointing here. Okay, so... As you can see, the composition of the Earth compared to the one of the universe is quite different. Uh, and we need to know the composition of different things or different sites uh, and, and to understand all the processes that go from one to the other. So it's obvious from, from how the pro, uh, percentage of elements in the universe are distributed that a long chain of events need to happen in order to arrive to, to the composition of the Earth crust. So uh, uh, this uh, is uh, being studied under the galactic chemical evolution. And for this, as I said, we need the chemical abundances of the stars. So how do we know how the elements are formed? So initially, uh, at the beginning of the universe, uh, there was just hydrogen. And then the first elements were formed in the primordial nucleosynthesis. So uh, this happened just very short uh, after the Big Bang. Uh, 
uh, where we have the uh, helium, uh, deuterium, and a small quantity of lithium. So the initial universe was mostly, mostly formed by hydrogen, hydrogen and helium. So then where do the rest of the elements come from? So the answer is in, the, answer is in the stars. This is through a stellar nucleosynthesis. So at the beginning, uh, uh, the first elements were formed by very massive stars that uh, died a long time ago. These were very massive stars uh, uh, with very short lifetimes that released the first metals into the universe. Uh, later, the next generations of the stars were processing this material and created, uh, created more and more metals in the universe to reach to the, to the proportions we can observe now. And uh, by uh, decades of studies and, and having a proper uh, chemical abundance studies of the stars, then we can reach to this nice periodic table where we can know much better uh, uh, what are the different nucleosynthesis processes uh, contribution to different elements. So from supernovae, uh, um, merging neutron stars, or just the slow uh, stellar nucleosynthesis happening during the evolution of, of such stars. But to reach to, the, to reach to this, as I say, we need to, to have uh, precise abundances. And for this, we need high resolution spectra. And with high resolution, I mean uh, usually about, about 40 or 50,000. Although you can do things, of course, with lower resolution, there are many elements which have very weak lines or uh, that are only accesses when you really have high, uh, high uh, uh, resolution. So it was in the early 90s uh, where there start to appear uh, studies with a significant number of stars, uh, like this seminal work by Edward Sonneton in 1993. Uh, uh, where uh, the abundances of alpha elements and other elements were shown versus the metallicity. This is the typical way of uh, representing the abundances. So usually you have the element versus the iron as a function of metallicity. And the, the metallicity is used as a, as a proxy of evolution because uh, it's a very uh, uh, easy element to determine in the stars. And usually we compare the stars with respect to, to this element. So these earlier studies already show that uh, uh, these alpha elements, which are the elements uh, uh, produced by alpha capture uh, uh, reactions, so oxygen, magnesium, titanium, uh, silicon, uh, they, they, use, uh, they, they show an increasing trend for uh, smaller metallicities as the metallicity decrease. So why, why this uh, happens? Okay, so this is, this is due to the um, stellar nucleosynthesis that happens in massive stars that is burning consecu uh, consecutively more and more elements uh, with these alpha captures. And then we have these reactions that give rise to these elements, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, titanium. And um, just before the stars uh, explode, a supernova type two, the massive stars, this is more or less the structure they have. So when they, when they explode, Apart from the explosive nucleosynthesis that happens during the explosion itself, you also have all these all these elements that are released to the to the interstellar medium. On the other hand, the iron and the iron peak elements are mostly produced in binary systems. Um, so these are exploding white dwarfs uh, uh, that have a, a companion in a binary system. So these are lower mass stars. And because these two uh, processes happen at different uh, 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 scale times, then we have this balance because massive stars uh, are, uh, have shorter lifetimes. So then they release the, their uh, products in the early universe, so at lower metallicity. So then at lower metallicities, we have this higher contribution from massive stars, so higher alpha abundances over iron. However, as the time passes, and then you give time to the low mass stars to die and release these elements to the universe, then you uh, get this balance of both uh, elements, and then this is what is called the knee, then uh, uh, you have the, the ratios that are equal. In, the, in more recent years, with the access to much higher uh, precision and, and, and higher uh, resolution spectra, we have been able not only to see this increase, but also to see the differentiation between the populations in the galaxy. So this study uh, was the first one uh, from Adivekian et al. in 2011, so in a new population of stars that are called high alpha metal rich stars that are clearly separated from the thick disk stars at the same metallicity, and that is not clear whether they are an extension of the thick disk or, uh, or they are a different uh, population. So if on top of the, uh, uh, the abundances, we can also have the stellar ages, then this really opens the door to a more insightful view on galactic archaeology. So in the last years, there have been great advances because many large surveys have been uh, producing very nice results. 
like uh, Lemos, Tapuji, Gala, Kepler, Gaia, Susarve. So then uh, with this, we can study so the contribution from different nuclear synthesis sites. Uh, uh, we can study them uh, uh, at different places in the galaxy, and then we can see how they vary uh, with the age and the metallicity. And this gives constraints to the models, to the models of galactic chemical evolution. Um, so as I said, uh, 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 with this uh, uh, work that um, uh, was presented in 2011, uh, this was the first work on a series that uh, I have, we have done in, in, uh, together with colleagues. Here, these are the alpha abundances that are the average of magnesium, silicon, and titanium. And here we can see the separation that I was telling you before. So these are the thickest stars that are, uh, are older. Uh, and these are these high alpha metal rich stars that uh, are like a new uh, population and the thin disk stars. And these purple ones are uh, uh, halo stars. So although we have had a lot of uh, results from these surveys that uh, are very important because uh, these previous surveys are mentioned because they are tracking stars that are far away also. So we can also have a much uh, broader picture of the full galaxy. However, uh, we also still need a smaller sample. So this one that has around 1000 stars with very high precision abundances because the spectra uh, has very high signal to noise. And here I'm talking about resolution. The Harps spectra has a resolution of 100,000. Um, uh, so we can get uh, uh, much uh, better precision. And the, the disadvantage of this is that these are based on the solar neighborhood only. So then we, we don't have information from, uh, uh, from stars that are farther away. But still, these this kind of studies are still very important uh, to, to, have, to do a better calibration of these galactic chemical evolution models. We have also studied uh, heavy elements, uh, so those that are uh, uh, created with neutron, cap neutron captures, uh, for example, copper, zinc, but then also these S-process elements, and you can see that they have a different behavior. Here I'm using uh, uh, similar, so you can see the similar separation for some of the elements, right? So, for example, for zinc, uh, that behave similar to alpha elements. You have uh, this thick disk and the high alpha metal rich stars that are quite well separated. Also in the copper, we can see this. Uh, then for these other elements, the S process, uh, you can see that the production uh, of, of these elements is it increases with metallicity with a maximum around solar metallicity. And on top of that, you can see uh, galactic chemical evolution models from different authors. So for some of the elements, the models work quite get well compared to the observations, but for others, uh, this is not the case. Uh, so, so then having this kind of studies uh, uh, is really useful to, to improve such models. And uh, I, I will mention especially that more, uh, more work is needed at higher metallicities. So for example, this sample that we have been using is very good in that sense because it has uh, quite uh, metal rich stars. So it will be nice to see what's going on here. So these, heavy, these heavier elements uh, uh, are formed uh, in younger stars, so uh, not sorry, in younger stars, in the stars that release their, uh, their products later in the, in the galaxy evolution. So these, they are the products of the um, low mass stars that produce these elements during the aging phase, during the thermal pulses. And these are the, the elements that are called the slow process neutron, neutron capture. Then, on the other hand, uh, the, there are other elements that are produced during the explosion of the core collapse supernovae, like europium, uh, by the rapid neutron capture uh, process. And then also recently, thanks to uh, uh, different works like the ones from LIGO, for example, it has been seen that also the neutron star collisions have a, a strong contribution to the R process. And they can create some more exotic elements like uh, gold and silver, platinum, but also radioactive, radioactive elements like thorium, uranium, and so on. So not only we study the elements uh, uh, with respect to iron, but also the elements between them. So different abundance ratios, because uh, when some of these elements, for example, European and oxygen that I'm showing here, um, although both of them have a major contribution, especially oxygen that is mainly formed uh, in massive stars. So both of them have a strong contribution from massive stars. By studying the trends with metallicity, we can maybe infer more information about the progenitors. So for example, here at lower metallicities, we see that europium uh, is lower than oxygen because it's negative. So then it means that the progenitors of uh, producing oxygen are probably more massive 
uh, and then uh, uh, died uh, earlier and, and, and released this oxygen into the interstellar medium that the progenitors produce in Europe and that probably are of lower masses. Um, and then with other elements, we can uh, we can do similar uh, analysis, especially with those ones that are produced in a single site, as happened with oxygen, that is that is uh, mostly 100% is for massive stars. We have also added the ages because, as I told you, this is a very important uh, um, piece of information to really better understand uh, the galactic archaeology. So for this sample, we have also derived ages just uh, using parallaxes from Gaia and uh, magnitudes and the parsec isochrons using the param interface. And then we were able to have a, a, a nice sample, reduced sample with errors in ages uh, smaller than 1.5 giga years. Of course, this is not fantastic. Uh, this is not like having ages from asteroid seismology, but I think it's one the best we can do at this moment with these kind of stars. And also, iron has been used typically as an age proxy. You can see here that in reality it's not. So there is a decreasing trend of metallicity with age. So older stars are less metallic, but you can have for the same age very broad ranges of metallicities. And later it has been shown, uh, not only by these works made by us, but also, of course, many other works, that however, the alpha uh, over iron radius are much better uh, age indicators than metallicity. You see the dispersion here is smaller. And for example, you can observe here uh, that uh, this uh, abundance is increased faster, let's say, with age. So this is showing that in the thick disk, that are these blue stars, uh, there was a more intense uh, star formation rate. Also, we can have the age uh, in color scale to see how the populations in the in this in this uh, abundance versus iron plane, how the age can give us more information. So, for example, here the thickness of stars have all a similar age, so they are very old. Uh, these are the limitations of of this method to get uh, with the isochrons that uh, we just go to to the very uh, high ages. There is not many difference between them. But then for the thin disk, we can see really a very nice stratification. Uh, so the youngest stars have the, are the ones that have the lowest alpha over iron. And then as you, for the same metallicity, as you uh, uh, go to older age, to, uh, to higher alpha ratios, you are also seeing older stars. And we can also see that these high alpha metal rich stars have similar ages as the metal uh, poor thin disk stars and similar alpha content. So the age is important to, to also uh, have extra information. And this age is very important also uh, um, to, to try to use the chemical abundance six by themselves as an age indicator. So it's the certain chemical abundance ratios that I will mention now. So for example, here uh, with other elements, not only alpha, you can also uh, observe very nice trends that, um, that thanks to this uh, high precision of the data we have in the solar neighborhood, because we have very good spectra, the stars are bright, then we can really see this stratification uh, in ages uh, uh, as the abundance is varies. For example, uh, if we compare aluminum and zinc, we see that they have a very similar behavior. So the abundance is increased as metallicity decreases uh, because these, these elements are forming massive stars. And then we can also see that the age has a, 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 an effect here. So older stars also have higher abundances for the uh, same uh, metallicity. We can also observe, for example, that for the S-process elements like strontium, yttrium, and barium, the maximum production is, is uh, obtained at uh, solar metallicity. This is something that the models more or less represent quite well. And this, is, this production uh, is made by the youngest stars that are uh, in the solar neighborhood. And um, uh, these trends of the abundance ratios with age uh, uh, can help us to have an alternative way of determining ages which is uh, using this uh, so-called chemical clocks. So these are uh, ratios of elements that have a strong dependence with age. So the idea is to mix elements that have a decreasing trend with age, like a strontium or yttrium, with elements that have an increasing trend with age, uh, like uh, magnesium or other alpha elements. Because this, uh, for example, strontium or yttrium are S process elements that are formed uh, in, in, by lower massive stars, then they increase with age. So younger stars have higher values. However, for the elements produced by massive stars, uh, then they, the abundance is increased as, uh, as the age increases so for older stars. However, in the first studies that uh, were using these chemical clocks uh, as, a, as a proxy to, to get an age, 
uh, were, were being used uh, with calibration formulas that are the same for uh, all the stars uh, in a given sample, but without taking care of the metallicity. And the metallicity is very important, as you can see here, because the slopes are not the same depending on the metallicity of the star. So the behaviors are different. So we have to take into account this. Okay, so uh, with this, I'm finishing the part on, on galactic chemical evolution. Uh, and now I will talk more about how the chemical abundances can help us uh, understand the planet formation processes and can, and can help us also to characterize the planets. So because planets are formed uh, in protoplanetary disks around their stars, they are made of the same material as the star was formed. So initially, you can logically, one could think that the composition of the planets is linked to that of the uh, of the stars. So to date, more than five thousand exoplanets have been discovered. Uh, here uh, you can see a plot for uh, for exoplanets archive. Uh, the increase of planets has been exponential with years, especially after the Kepler launch. Um, and in this other plot, you can see how different uh, met uh, detection methods can prove different uh, part, different regions in the mass period diagram. So some techniques are more sensitive to planets that are further away, others are more uh, sensitive to uh, more massive planets. So it's needed to, uh, to have different kind of uh, um, methods to try to populate this, uh, this diagram. In order to get the abundances of the stars, we need a spectra. So uh, most of the studies are based on these uh, radial velocity planets, but also for the transiting planets, uh, we also have a, a, a lot of good spectra. And, and, and we can use this information to, to uh, better characterize these planets. So when the first uh, surveys of uh, systematic search for planets were started uh, in the late 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, one correlation started to show up uh, that now is very well established, which is the giant metallicity correlation. So here what it's seen is that the stars that have uh, planets, uh, giant planets, have a distribution in metallicity at larger metallicities than those that don't have. This has been observed by different studies and now uh, it's uh, it's accepted that this is a uh, it, this has a, like a primordial origin. And so, in the sense that you need to have a, a, a high metal rich content in order to form to form giant planets. Uh, later studies uh, were focusing more in in, in less massive uh, less massive planets because as the techniques improved, then we were able to discover to discover less massive planets like uh, Neptunes or super Earths. And here the correlations are not so clear. So uh, different uh, works by different authors found, for example, this one with Kepler. Uh, this is based on radii, but not, not instead of masses. So when that the metallicity distribution of these low mass, these low uh, small planets is similar to the field stars, then this is with the Harps and Coralie radial velocity uh, surveys. These are the distributions of these uh, uh, of these uh, smaller planets. And also the metallicity is not as clear as for the planets that have uh, 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 higher masses of giant planets. So then maybe for these stars, for these planets, uh, it's not so critical the metallicity. Then later, the next step was to not only check the metallicity, but to check individual elements. So can we know more about these formation pathways by studying the different abundances? So the, the first study is doing this didn't find very clear uh, correlations because they were uh, based on uh, small uh, samples. And many times the, the comparison samples, so, so samples that don't have planets detected, they were not uh, uh, properly characterized or, or uh, they were not good to do this kind of studies. But uh, this thing changed with this harp CTO sample that uh, we have also used for the galactic chemical evolution studies. Uh, because we, we have a very uh, statistical significant uh, uh, sample in terms of numbers. So with a lot of stars where we have searched for planets and, and giant planets have not been found. So we know that these stars don't have planets, giant planets at least. And uh, one very clear thing that was found in 2012 was that the stars that have planets that are the red and the blue ones uh, uh, have an increase in the alpha over iron abundances as metallicity decreases. So it seems that so the red points are the Jupiter hosts and the blue points are the Neptunians. So this points to the fact that maybe when the quantity of iron uh, is not very high, then you need to compensate it with alpha elements. 
uh, and alpha elements in this case are in this in this plot are titanium, magnesium, and silicon. So, uh, and this is this, this is something we know, right? The most important elements for planet formation, as we see in the Earth and in other uh, uh, rocky planets, are the iron, oxygen, silicon, and magnesium. Um, so, so this is, this might be a way to overcome this lack of metallicity, lack of iron. Then you can compensate it with these uh, other elements. We have also tried to do this for other uh, elements uh, uh, that a priori are not maybe so much so important for planet formation. Uh, like these heavier elements, in some cases, what we are seeing is just that, uh, for example, we found uh, that planet hosts have a higher uh, abundances of zinc, but this is not because zinc is an important element for planet formation, just because it has a similar galactical, galactical chemical calio evolution as alpha elements. So you need to consider the, the galactic context for comparison purposes. It's not only just comparing the abundances per se. And it's important to compare the abundances at the same metallicity. Uh, because like that, you are a bit um, um, diminishing the effects of galactic chemical evolution. We have tried to do the same with carbon in a more recent paper, but uh, this element is harder to, to determine and the errors are larger. So we don't have so many stars. So we also find hints that carbon can be important uh, at lower metallicities, but uh, this is at the borderline of being statistically significant because of the low numbers I told you. Um, and uh, uh, and also with oxygen, uh, we we find a tentative uh, in indication that this abundance is also increased. But uh, of course, with oxygen, it's even much worse because this is a very difficult element with very weak lines, and and the abundances have very large errors. So this is something that uh, uh, was also discussed in the paper by Hay with uh, two thousand and nine. How the increase of abundances uh, at a lower metallicity points that these planets. Uh, these lower mass planets are easier to form in the thick disk than in the thin disk, because in the thick disk you have uh, larger amounts of these uh, alpha elements. Um, but, okay, so with these abundances, we can also try, so not just to do population studies uh, in terms of general samples of planet hosts, but also try to understand better the planets from an individual point of view. This is the um, typical uh, radius mass diagram for exoplanets uh, uh, with where these lines show different uh, internal compositions. So this, there is a degeneracy. Uh, uh, planets with similar density can have different compositions. So by using uh, the stellar abundances, uh, using them as a proxy for the bulk composition of planets, we can try to better constrain uh, this composition and try to understand better what is the internal structure of these planets. One of the uh, pioneering works uh, in this topic was made by Bonnet Oli in 2010, who was using stellar abundances to create uh, protoplanetary embryos. And then with dynamical and chemical and body simulations, she was creating uh, the possible planets that could be formed around such stars at different uh, distances to the star. And then with this, you can determine the bulk composition of these planets. Uh, and then uh, what they observe is that uh, uh, with the range of stellar abundances that we have in the samples with, uh, with planets, you can have a wide range in also in bulk composition for, for the internal, uh, for the, sorry, a bulk internal composition for these planets. And especially there are two uh, elemental ratios that are very important to, to determine how it's going to be the internal composition of, of such planets, which are the carbon oxygen and the magnesium silicon. So the carbon oxygen controls um, uh, how the, the, the oxygen can be distributed in silicates. So because if you have a very high uh, CO ratios, you almost don't have oxygen to form silicates, but then you will have carbon rich phases such as uh, graphite uh, uh, and, and some uh, uh, carbides like uh, silicon carbide or titanium carbide. However, for most of the planet hosts and so for the stars, we find CO ratios below 0.8. Uh, and this means that then the, 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 the mineralogy uh, will be controlled by this uh, magnesium silicon. It will control how uh, the distribution of, of uh, the elements are uh, made by different silicates. So for example, uh, when you have a magnesium silicon, silicon ratio lower than one, then you have uh, mostly pyroxen, pyroxen, and then the excess silicon uh, is going to form feldspars. 
Then when you have close uh, ratios above one, then you have magnesium that is mainly distributed between olivine and pyroxene. And then when you have very high ratios of magnesium silicon that are not observed, then you have all the silicon as olivine. And these silicates uh, are kind of, so they will shape uh, how the uh, the crust and the and the uh, mantle composition and the different layers uh, are formed. However, at this point, just I want to warn about so we have to be careful with these stellar abundances, especially with the carbon oxygen ratios uh, when you want to use them to understand the planetary composition. Because especially with oxygen, it's a very tricky element, and then uh, we have a lot of errors, and then there are systematic. So here uh, we we saw how the CO ratios, uh, as a function of metallicity, depend a lot whether you are using one oxygen line or another oxygen line in the in, in the uh, stellar spectra. So for when you are using this line that is known as the forbidden line, uh, yeah, you can have very high CO ratios that probably are not uh, real, right? Um, you see the errors are very large. However, when you see this other oxygen indicator, then you have a, a, a lower dispersion. And most importantly, you don't find a, a very clear systematics uh, between uh, stars of different temperature. Here we see that cooler stars, sorry, uh, that are the green points have much larger CO ratios. And this is caused by the abundances themselves uh, because they have a strong dependence on age. So it's important to, to try to use the best oxygen, the best abundances you can, uh, you can have access to, but also to minimize the systematics. Uh, it's good also to measure uh, the solar abundances in the same way as you measure the carbon and the oxygen, and then you cancel out uh, the systematics due to, to the methods and the model atmospheres. Um, so with these elemental ratios, the carbon oxygen and the magnesium silicon. Um, um, we can we can obtain more insights about the internal composition. So the carbon and oxygen are a bit tricky because since they have low condensation temperatures, uh, then this CO ratio in the planets uh, it's more dependent on the distance to the star where the planet was formed. However, in the case of the iron magnesium and iron silicon ratios, there are more constants because these elements uh, uh, condense, uh, let's say, fast in the in the in the planet formation phases. So uh, you can, they are more similar to the stellar values. And this has been observed in the solar system where these, these ratios are quite similar between the sun, Mars, Venus, and Earth. However, for carbon and oxygen, it's not the same. Whether your planet was formed uh, farther away than uh, after the snow line or it was formed closer to the star. And the use of this bulk uh, iron and silicon radius, uh, it's uh, very useful to reduce the system degeneracy uh, in the internal structure of planets and, and to uh, constrain much better the planet composition. So these are the typical models that are used, uh, are kind of, let's say, simple models. So they are considering a core uh, formed by iron and an iron alloy, so either nickel or sulfur. Then you have the lower mantle, the upper mantle with different kind of silicates, uh, as I explained before. And then you can add to your model a layer of liquid water or even an atmosphere. Um, so can we use the stellar abundances as a direct proxy of the bulk composition of planets? Well, this can be done initially with the rocky planets because then, first of all, you remove the outer layer so you don't have to worry about uh, um, uh, the atmosphere. So, for example, this uh, nice work by uh, Sulset et in 2021, they, they calculate the core mass fraction from the stellar abundances of the stars with the core mass fraction of the planets obtained just from the mass and the radius of the planets. Assuming a, a simple model in which you have a planet with a solid iron core and a mantle with uh, uh, oxidized silicate, so no iron in the mantle. And then they found that distributions of these core mass fractions in general are the indistinguishable uh, between the star and the planet, except in very few cases, in only one, two of, of uh, 11 uh, planet cores that they studied. In one of them, for example, they found that the core mass fraction of the planet was much higher, higher than that of the star. So this was hinting that probably this is a supermercury planet, so planets that have a very high density. And on the other hand, they found another case in which the planet uh, has a, a much smaller core mass fraction at the star. So this is a low density small planet that uh, are still not clear uh, how they can be formed. Also in this work by Adi Vekiamitol in 2021, uh, um, there was uh, made a, an homogeneous study with stellar abundances of planets and, uh, and their stars. 
and using only planets that have uh, very low errors in mass uh, and radius, so below 30%. So what they did was to compare the iron to silicate mass fraction of the stars with that of, of their planet. You can see it here. So this is the iron mass fraction of the planet, and this is the one of the star. And they found that there is a clear correlation between the both, both of them, although the values are not exactly the same. So the correlation is not one to one. And there is this group of planets that are uh, uh, that have a very large uh, uh, core mass fraction or iron mass fraction. Uh, so that they are very dense uh, for a given uh, for a for a given uh, iron mass fraction in the star. It's true that they are mostly form our own stars with a higher metallicity, but they are clearly separated. So for these ones, uh, we have to be more careful uh, when trying to to extrapolate. The, the stellar radius to the ones of, of uh, the planets. Also, we can study the planetary bulk composition of the protoplanetary uh, embryos or, or the, the, the seeds that are going to give rise to planets, but in the galactic context. So this was the work done by Santos et al. in 2017, where they compare uh, just by using the abundances of iron, magnesium, silicon, carbon, and oxygen, uh, they derive the core mass fractions and the water mass fractions of these stars. And, and see what will be the hypothetical planets that you can form there. So the, the, the seeds uh, of possible planets change it depending on the population uh, where the star belongs from. So they found that, for example, in the, the, the stars that are in the thick disk, uh, that are these blue, light blue ones, have a larger content of water. And this is mostly done, mostly due because these stars in the thick disk have larger amounts of oxygen. So you can have uh, um, uh, protoplanetary material with, uh, with uh, a larger amount of, of water, and in, in principle, you can have uh, you can form planets with a higher uh, water fraction. On the other hand, uh, you can see that the stars that are uh, uh, in the in the thin disk have uh, larger iron mass fractions because the, the quantity of iron is is larger. So it's important also to study. Uh, the different populations of planets we can have depending on, on, on the galaxy position of the stars. This has also been done uh, by Vich and Battistini, and in this case they were, they were seeing uh, um, this composition of the protoplanetary embryos, but uh, outer and inner to the, um, uh, to the iron, to the uh, CO line. And they, were, they saw, for example, that the, that the planets that are formed further away in the disk uh, uh, have a strong dependence uh, with metallicity in terms of the water mass fraction that are this point. So as you go to small to lower metallicities, then these planetary building blocks uh, um, have uh, higher amounts of, of water. It's also important uh, in, in terms of stellar advances to, to study the radioactive nucleates. In this sense, there are very few studies because these elements are difficult to, to determine. But they are very interesting because uh, they can have they have an important uh, impact on the plate tectonics and the volcanics, and this in turn can uh, impact the planet habitability. And also, their works have like this one by one have explored the use of European abundances as, as a proxy for radiogenic heat, uh, because since European has a similar uh, evolution chemical evolution as the thorium, and that since thorium is much more difficult to determine, then you can use these European abundances to better understand also. Uh, um, this other factor in the planetary formation and evolution. So not only uh, not only the, the the abundances can have an effect of the planet formation, but also the planets can affect the stellar abundances themselves because there can be accretion processes. Uh, there are I'm not mentioning here, but there are many studies uh, on the TC trends or how the um, the condensation temperature of the elements. Um, can affect uh, um, uh, the abundances that you observe in stars that have accreted or not uh, material. And then you can also study the effects on light elements, like lithium and beryllium, because these elements are very easily uh, destroyed in still interior, and they are, they are more prone to mixing processes that can happen inside of the star. And these mixing processes have a strong connection to the angular momentum history of the stars. So uh, we found, for example, uh, regarding lithium, uh, we found that the stars that have planets have uh, are depleted in lithium, but only around solar temperature stars. So in a very narrow range uh, where the convective envelope has this size that can be sensible to this 
planetary formation processes affected the angular uh, uh, momentum evolution. And um, uh, also other studies have found that the most lithium depleted stars also have fewer refractory elements. Also, you have a, a broad range of lithium abundances uh, for a given age. That is also another factor that can affect these lithium abundances. So it's quite hard to disentangle these effects and it would be ideal to have um, to study these abundances in very young uh, uh, planet hosts um, when, when these interactions between the disk and the, and the star are still taking place. Um, so what we observe is that the stars that have uh, uh, larger amounts, so that have uh, uh, a, bigger, a bigger mass, so giant planets, have the, so this stronger effect with lithium. They have more depleted abundances. Uh, there can also be an effect at later phases of evolution. Uh, so the lithium rich ions that are stars that have are supposed so are not supposed to have uh, high values of lithium because they, it should have been destroyed after the RGB phase. But then uh, some of them show high lithium abundances and some of the uh, theories uh, that have been put on the table is that the accretion of, um, of plant the engulfment of planets when the stars expand in, uh, in this RGB phase can cause this increase in lithium abundances. And okay, now I'm going to briefly mention the end dwarfs because as you have seen, I have been talking only about FGK stars that are the stars that we can better characterize. We weld them, uh, we know them quite well and, and the spectra it's clean and it's nice, I would say. But then we have the end dwarfs that uh, are a mess uh, and they are much more problematic. So in the optical, mm, there, there are a lot of molecular absor absorption that depress the continuum. There are uh, these molecules, so they, they, all the lines are blended. It's very hard to, to determine not only parameters, not only abundances, but also the parameters. And uh, you can see this uh, nice study by Vera Passeir in, in 2022 that did a comparison uh, of uh, different methods from different groups. Uh, for a, a sample of uh, stars observed with carbonates. And they found that, okay, for the temperature, there are more or less agreements and, and the, the techniques can get more or less good values. However, for the metallicity, uh, there is a weakness. And I'm not talking here about gravity because it's even more complicated, but there is a, there is a degeneracy in the models, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, in the spectra, in the synthesis spectra or in different methods that you can have uh, these degeneracy in temperature and metallicity and also with log G providing similar uh, spectra. So then it's very hard to disentangle uh, these parameters. And we will need to improve this, this, um, uh, these methods because many of the current planetary search surveys are, are being done around uh, M dwarfs because since they are lower mass stars, it's easier to find lower mass planets. So the possible uh, Earth 2.0 should be around uh, an M dwarf. There have been very nice advances in the last couple of years. Uh, here I just mentioned a, a pair of papers uh, used with the spectra from Carmenes and from Apogee, where they were already able to, to determine individual abundances. But as you can see, uh, this is the same plot I was showing you before. So in the background, you can see the FGK stars, and this is for the M's. The, the errors are huge. So of course, it's very difficult to, to say here to which populations these stars belong from. And then, of course, using these abundances to constrain the planetary interiors, it will be much more difficult because the errors are very large. But uh, OK, uh, uh, very nice works are being done and others that are uh, in process. So I think this uh, will really improve in the next year, especially with the use of near infrared spectra, because in the near infrared, you don't have so many molecules and, and you start to see isolated uh, atomic lines. So that gives uh, access to the derivation of individual abundances. And just, I will make a bit of publicity uh, uh, of a catalog uh, that uh, we have in our, in our institute that has been an effort of many years. So uh, all these trends that I have shown you in this plot that we have done, it's uh, our, 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 we were able to do them because it's a big, we are analyzing big samples of stars and all of them analyze in the same way with uh, in an homogeneous way, uh, trying to use a spectra of similar quality and and of course using the same tools. So this is very important to really um, try to find uh, these correlations between abundances and, and, and parameters like the planet metallicity correlation. So when you mix uh, determinations from different teams, uh, uh, then it's difficult to see these effects. So uh, we have this catalog that it's uh, publicly available with uh, stellar parameters for a large sample of, of planet hosts, mostly FGK, 
and, and we are planning in the future uh, to complement them also with stellar abundances. So this can be useful also for the community to study also uh, the internal composition of exoplanets, of rocky exoplanets, as I uh, saw before. Okay, and just, uh, okay, the conclusion, so just to finish, uh, so as I have shown, the determination of chemical abundances is critical for many fields in astrophysics. We need very high resolution and high signal to noise to resolve some of the atomic lines for specific species like oxygen, it's very tricky, or some of these exotic elements, uh, heavy elements. We also need to start, study the stars at different metallicities to understand which different processes take place in different parts of the galaxies and at different time scales. And in what regards the, the, the planets themselves, it's clear that we need very precise stellar characterization, not only to just determine the mass and the, and, and the radius of the planets, which are dependent on the mass and the radius of the star, but also to understand the, the composition, the formation processes, um, and even the evolution of such planets. Uh, the studies have shown that there is, you need a minimum quantity of metals in order to form planets. I think the lowest metallicity planets, I mean, the lowest metallicity of the star hosting a planet is around minus 0 0.7. So it seems that it's hard to, to form these planets below this limit. But uh, the the, 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 uh, this, this uh, lower quantity of iron can be compensated by other elements. Uh, in, important for uh, internal composition like the alpha elements, magnesium, silicon, oxygen. And uh, these elements are, are important not only to unveil the bulk internal composition but and the structure of exoplanets, but also to understand other processes like volcanism, uh, the plate tectonics, the radiogenic heat, uh, uh, and so on. Okay, and uh, this is uh, everything uh, I have to, to tell you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa, for this wonderful talk. So now I will pass the word to Pedro Amado. He will manage the question and answer sessions. So Pedro, go on, please. Yeah, hello. <clears throat> Thanks, Rene. Thanks, Elisa, for this very nice talk. Um, uh, we open this round of questions uh, for people attending the seminar. Um, I myself have a few, uh, mainly from the last part of your of your talk. So maybe to open fire here, I will I will start with my own questions. <clears throat> you show here in these conclusions um, that stars uh, need to have a minimum quantity of metals, you know, in, to form the the planets. We 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 need some um, amount of dense material to, to uh, uh, form, um, to form a, um, a core of at least 10 Earth masses to then start accreting um, gas to form the giants and so on. Um, but we also know that there are um, planets that have been found around stars that have very low, very low metallicity. When I did this uh, in the 2018 workshop, so it's been now some time, and this uh, field uh, advanced very quickly, I found that there were around 15 systems uh, with um, metallicities uh, less than 0.7. One of them was, I think, if I remember properly, Captain Star. So, um, so do you think that in these cases, of course, if everything is correct, if the metallicity has been has been measured correctly, if the planet has been detected correctly, if it, wasn't, if it is not something else like a magnetic activity uh, or whatever. So do you think these uh, other uh, elements could be um, playing a, a major role in the formation of these uh, systems? Yes, well, okay. What I have said is based, of course, in the in the core accretion uh, theory to planet formation, because there is also the gravitational instabilities that, as far as I remember, doesn't have uh, so much uh, strong dependence on metallicity. Um, so, okay, I, I said minus 0 0.7, but uh, I didn't remember exactly uh, uh, about these values. I don't know if these 15 stars that you say are all M dwarfs. 
or are also FGK stars. I remember that some years ago, also there even was a claim about uh, about a planet form uh, in a in a halo star or very very far away star, but then later it was refuted. If this, this is, is Captain Captain Star, I think it is the one you are mentioning here. This is an M dwarf, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. So okay, the problem of the M dwarfs is that right now we cannot compare the metallicity scales; they are different or at least we are not sure they are the same. That's why it's so important to improve this, uh, these methods. And it's needed also to, so I, I think the, the infrared is going to give us a, a nice opportunity to test. So to try to compare if the metallicity scales for FGK stars are the same in the optical and in the near infrared, and then try to, to expand this to the end dwarfs. But since the, 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 the way these metallicities are measured are, are much more degenerate, degenerate I, I don't think, I mean, the errors are still quite large. So I don't, I don't think you can say, okay, because the metallicity of this end dwarf is minus 0 0.8, then this means that the planet is not real. No, maybe it can be. And then probably this planet belongs to the thick disk because we have seen that, at least in the Harp CTO, that, um, as long as you go to lower metallicities, all the planets are in the thick disk, especially those with the lower masses. So, so maybe, yes, you can have a smaller metallicity, but then you need to compensate it with other material to, to form the planets. Yeah, I, and, and just now you have been mentioning uh, uh, this, this uh, possibility of using the infrared spectrographs to determine the, the metallicities for, or some of the abundances for these stars, for M dwarfs. Uh, I, I haven't seen many, or I haven't seen words uh, doing doing this. Uh, of course, I, I haven't followed much the um, no, the, 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 the the results on this uh, on this line. You will know much better than I do. Um, is it so? Is there, there there haven't been many works on using the infrared high resolution spectrographs to determine metallicities or? So for example, you have Carmenes that uh, I guess people in the Granada know very well. Uh, and there are many studies with Carmenes, but they have been mostly using um, uh, not so much the far near infrared, but closer to the red part. So the, the redder part of the optical, but there are also works mm -hmm. by Vera Passager using the near infrared. And now there are later works by people in, in the Complutense, for example, also uh, uh, using the, the, the near infrared part. There are the works from Apogee, but the problem of Apogee is that lower resolution is only 22,000. So maybe the methods are not comparable. Then there is this very interesting paper of the Japanese using Carmen's spectra that show that I think it's this one. Uh, that is very tricky because the atomic lines are sensitive to changes in abundances not only of these elements but also of other elements and uh, uh, this is something that in the FGK stars we don't see so it's much this like, like this is much more difficult to to determine the individual abundances and then we have always talked about the planet metallicity correlation in terms of what we know for FGK stars but then it's, it's, we really need to set a correct scale. So you can find studies in the literature that have systematically uh, M dwarfs with very low metallicities. In others, they tend to find higher metallicities for all the stars. So there is a very big uh, uh, dispersion in the results. And, and um, maybe one way to overcome this is to, to study, to try to study with the same technique techniques, although it's not so it's not really exactly possible to do it, but to use both FGK and M's in the in near infrared to study both of them. This is something we want to do. And I think some people also from SPIRU uh, has been doing that, uh, the SPIRU spectrograph in, in, in Hawaii, to try to compare these, uh, these abundances and, and try to get uh, better parameters. So then we need to use the binaries, uh, the FGK plus M binaries to do this, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, when, when I was saying that there were not many works, uh, of course, I'm completely biased and I was meaning outside. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> no, yes, there are, there are. You have these people yeah, from Apogee and, and Espiru yeah, yeah. and, and also with Crires, there were studies in the past. And now NIRPS has started working. Uh, so we yeah. will also use NIRPS data to, to analyze this and it will be very nice to compare the results to what has been obtained with Carmen. And Cryers sure. is, is back to the telescope, ask Cryers Plus. So yes, Cryers yeah, Plus, we also... offer of, of, of the infrared spectrograph there to do this kind of work. Yeah, sure.
Okay, I'm gonna give the audience another opportunity to to ask a question. Um, I have a, I a, a, a question, a naive question. Can I? Go go ahead, Mayra. Yes, I understood that all this study has been done for the cases N, uh, K star, low mass star, and mean. Uh, which are the prospect for the case of B O O star in terms of the abundance, in terms of the planet formation, perhaps? Could you comment a few words about this? Stars? Yes. Massive stars? Okay, so for massive stars, I never studied them, but I know they hardly have atomic lines, right? So uh, except for the v, for the OV stars, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know lines more than uh, hydrogen, helium, and maybe some metals. Then you can get abundances for the for the AM stars. So these are the A stars that are usually magnetic, magnetically active, and they are peculiar because they have uh, 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 they have strong lines. And then you can check the abundances of the, of these stars. But these are special stars, so I, I I don't think they are being done studies of abundances for planet purposes around these stars. And then on the other hand, the planet formation around massive stars um, uh, is still not uh, fully understood uh, because there are not many planets discovered for planetary for stellar masses uh, above three solar masses. So these are BS types, let's say. Then uh, to discover these planets, we have to go to the Wolf counterparts, so the, the, to the K giants, where we can apply the radial velocity and the, and the um, transit method. And some planets have been discovered, but the planetary frequency really drops down after two, three solar masses. Uh, so then you can, in these stars, you can study the abundances in the giant stars, not the light elements, because they are processed inside of the star, and then you cannot get the abundances that were supposed to be in the protoplanetary disk, so carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, in these abundances change. However, the alpha elements are not so affected. And then, yes, you can also compare the, you could compare also the abundances uh, of these elements to try to correlate to the formation of, of this star. But this is more for A stars. A stars and their evolved counterparts. For O and B, uh, I don't think there are many studies. There are. There is now a, a survey that is called BIST that is starting to find Planetary bodies, or probably brown dwarfs, uh, with direct imaging around. There was a discovery around a nine solar mass star, but of course this has this should be or try to be confirmed by other methods, not only by the direct imaging, and to see if this is really a a, a brown dwarf or is even a low mass star or or uh, yeah. So it's really hard to find this planet. It's very massive challenging. Stars. No? It's very challenging. Let's, uh, study this kind of star. Thank you. Thanks, Mayra. Um, uh, any other questions? Um, if there aren't any, I, I have one that maybe we can extend it offline. Uh, so briefly, Elisa, um, um, well, we are trying now to constrain uh, planetary interiors of terrestrial planets, uh, especially in, in M dwarfs, uh, particularly uh, here. We, we are trying to do that, but uh, of course, um, this this the only way we have now is trying to get uh, ratios of of, of metals you know, like uh, you have mentioned uh, silicon and magnesium uh, with respect to iron from the star and then assuming that these are the same for the planet and and, and this this will help us constrain this this planetary interiors. Um, what, what are the, the the steps, if any, that are still missing or that is preventing us from from doing this more precisely or or, or better than, than we are currently doing. So, if I remember well, so to constrain the the internal composition of planets, uh, I think the most relevant parameter is the radius of the planet itself. Uh, this is the one that is going to mostly affect the density, and then in turn the, the composition. So, if you have a large error in the in the radius, I think it doesn't matter so much the abundances. However, when you have a good precision in radius, and this is something that is being achieved now with TES and, and with Keops uh, and in the future with Plato, then the, the abundances will play an important role. But still, an error in the abundance, uh, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but uh, the typical errors we have can suppose an error in the, in the let me show, for example, 
uh, this one. Okay, so these are um, these are uh, planet hosts, uh, which very good uh, spectra uh, and high resolution, and with a very careful analysis. And this is the errors in the in the iron mass fraction of the star. So still, you see, you have you have an error. It's smaller than the one in the of the of the planet because it's very uh, it's very dependent on the radius. But still, you have this error. And this is for FGK stars. Then for the M's, here the, the errors in abundances are really very small, uh, maybe 0 0.05 dex. Then if you go to, to the M's, as I saw here, uh, the errors are 0 0.2, 0 0.3 dex. So I don't know now the right number, how it translates into the core mass fraction, but maybe the core mass fraction can change, I don't know, from uh, from 20, from 30% to 30 to 40% or 50, and it changed a lot. So I think it's still hard to, to use these ratios for, for M dwarfs. And, and, and I think it's easier to get a more precise mass and radius than the, from the information from the stellar uh, abundance side. But in the future, of course, I think uh, this will improve, hopefully. <laughs> It will improve. Yeah, we hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Elisa. Uh, I um, I don't have any other questions, and we I don't see any hands raised from the audience. So um, we thank you once again for your nice talk. Uh, so I give you a. <laughs> thanks a lot, Anuel. Sorry, but this was very dense. Maybe uh, uh, I touched very different things and, and I didn't have time to explain all the things in detail, but uh, I think it's nice to have a, a broad view of uh, what, we can do, what we can do with chemical abundances and, and how important they are for many different fields in, in astrophysics. Sure, I think, I think it was probably enough to interest uh, many people other than us uh, uh, working in neutral or planetary uh, studies. Thank you again, and okay. I pass the floor to Isabel. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'd like to thank you again, um, uh, Elisa. It's been a, a pleasure your, your talk. I mean, very dense. It, more, it I mean, you, you can understand that for me that it has been even, even more difficult because it's a completely different field. But um, but I found it very interesting. So thank you very much. Okay, thank to you also. <laughs>